and welcome to another Jacobin round table discussion, this time on Spain's transformational left wing party, Podemos, uh, its origins and its future. My name, I'm a journalist based in London and a Jacobin contributor, uh, but tonight I have the enormous pleasure of being the host of this particular debate. But before we get there, uh, let me remind you that if you like this particular show and if you'd like to continue watching Jacobin's Roundtables, we have yet another one next Monday, same time, 6 p.m. ET uh, on the AMLO government in Mexico. So be sure to like and subscribe, click the like button um, and watch it on a Monday. And so without any further ado, let me introduce to you tonight's panelists. First and foremost, Owen Gilmartin, who covers all matters on Spanish politics for Jacobin and whose work has also been featured in Tribune, Open Democracy, Navarra and Contexto. Uh, then we have Roger Tamames, who is the editor of Politica Exterior and author of the book For the People, Left Populism in Spain and the US, published this month by Lawrence and Wishart. And finally, uh, Tommy Green, who is a freelance journalist covering Spain and the UK and Ireland, three quite interesting uh, countries, and whose work has also appeared in The Guardian, Independent, Open Democracy, and of course, Jacobin. So welcome to you all. Um, I mean, this is a particularly uh, side gassy topic to be discussing in 2020, uh, these uh, controversial to some very popular to others, uh, governmental arrangements across uh, the Western world. And Unidas Podemos as part of a uh, coalition government in Spain is no exception to that by the country. However, Podemos started with perhaps slightly different ambitions or maybe the same ambitions, but expecting a different trajectory about six years ago. And it finds itself now in a very almost traditional uh, coalition with the Socialist Party in Spain, also known as PSOE. Um, I was thinking maybe, Owen, we could start with you. If you could contextualize for people who have only heard of Podemos or perhaps never heard of Podemos, what its recent but nonetheless history is and within the context of Spanish politics. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, Podemos was founded in, in early 2014 um, at the height of the Euro crisis. Um, and I guess its initial importance for, for an international audience was that I guess before Corbyn, before Bernie Sanders, before Mélenchon, it demonstrated that the left could compete for um, for governmental power. That uh, there was, I guess, a path to to elect um, to electoral victory for for the radical left. Um, I guess initially the party was formed between a, a group of university professors who had studied particularly um, the pink way. Uh, the Pink Tide governments in Latin America, um, and a small Trotskyite party, um, which which formed the initial cadre um, or initial cadre of activists for the party. Um, and I guess their their initial analysis was that um, was that the political center at the height of the Euro crisis, the political center was was obviously in crisis and was partially in in collapse. Um, and that there was a historic window of opportunity for the left if it could um, organize electorally. Um, I think you have to remember, I mean, the, this was a moment in which the, the two-party political system um, in Spain had been widely discredited. Um, the socialist administration of Zapatero in 2010 had, um, had asked for a, a, a 60 billion Euro loan uh, or bailout from from the European Union um, to rescue the to rescue the Spanish banks, and in exchange had to implement deep austerity. Um, so you had a situation in which austerity was introduced by the centre left socialists and then deepened um, after two thousand and eleven by the the Spanish right by the government of Mariano Rajoy. Um, the social reaction to this was obviously the famous Indignados movement, uh, beginning in May May 2011, um, similar to Occupy, um, but but actually a genuine mass movement. I mean, something like 20% of the Spanish population 
um, participated in the assemblies and protests of the indignados. You're talking like not nine million people. Um, so it was a very volatile moment um, in which, yeah, I mean the the initial the the initial leadership of Podemos believed there was this historic opportunity to, in a sense, to take governmental power in you know in one leap in one electoral cycle. So you had an 18 month period from its breakthrough at the European elections in um, was it, in May 2014 until the general elections in December 2015. And so I think they said there was so there was a historic opportunity, but at the same time with with the indignados movement, the, the indignados movement also represented a defeat for the left in the sense um, in the sense that it wasn't being driven by by left wing organizations or you know people were not reacting to a call from from existing left wing leadership or organizations instead like with occupy it was younger precarious workers um lacking any other form of sort of political or collective organization who who were spontaneously organizing the, uh, these events um and so I guess the most prominent figure, obviously, in Podemos is the leader Pablo Iglesias, who started, um, who became a household name as a as a TV as a TV pundit. Basically, he appeared on um, different panel shows, and in the wake of the Indignados movement, he tried to introduce a new political vocabulary that could speak speak to people who were involved in this movement, um, so that the left. I guess his point was that the left couldn't could no longer just speak to people who had already been politicized and had a clear left wing uh, identity. You needed, as he said, to speak to the people, not just the left. Um, and so he he would be, go on go on television to these uh, panel shows um, using terminology like democracy, like popular sovereignty, like human rights, but ab above all, the idea of um, la casta, the the caste. Um, in a sense, he was naming the enemy of this of this new movement. That um, you know, the the, the sort of political and um, political and economic establishment, this sort of um, ruling ruling block that, in a sense, um, was was imposing neoliberalism. So this idea, I guess, translated then into into Podemos's initial left populist discursive strategy that. You would reorientate um, political debate around the division between, um, yeah, the caste, the political and economic establishment, and the people, or those at the top of society and those at the bottom. At the same time, you would narrow the agenda. Um, so, in that eighteen-month period, uh, Podemos wanted to basically talk about two issues: um, questions of, of, I don't know, redistribution. Um, and and corruption and that in a sense all the historical baggage of the of the spanish left had to be left to one side you would not talk about monarchy uh the monarchy and uh, republicanism you would not talk about the national issue catalan independence or uh, historical justice relating to the franco regime you would only talk about sort of um one political corruption and two um questions like housing rights austerity etc um and so yeah i mean this this um this narrow narrowed the focus at the same time i guess the initial um the initial leadership um decided on a very particular organization organizational structure for the party after making its initial breakthrough at the european elections um at the founding con uh, congress of the party they they organized the party as a what they called an electoral war machine. So it was going to be a very much a, a top ten, top ten organization, um, designed very much around the around the the presence, the charismatic presence of the leadership on television. Um, the idea was literally you have eighteen months to take government power. We are going to you know. Um, Questions of internal debate, of grassroots activism, were sort of sidelined, uh, and everything was focused on, um, on, on I guess a sort of media strategy. Um, 
And in a sense, these two things, this particular organizational structure and its discursive strategy more or less paid off. They, in the two, 2015 elections, they, they got more than 20%, just falling short of um, the famous Sorpasso of overtaking uh, the socialists as the main left-wing um, left force. And so you had, you had this amazing rapid advance, but then once they entered the institutions, in a sense, they lost this initial sense of purpose. Um, and they were left, I guess, then having to, to negotiate how they were going to position themselves um, institutionally and socially afterwards. So I guess, you know, I guess we've, we are in a moment now where we're looking back at this sort of left populist phase um, after after Corbyn's electoral defeat uh, before Christmas, after Bernie Sanders. And I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, Podemos bet big on trying to, trying to make this initial breakthrough, take government power in 18 months, um, and just, just, just fell short. Um, so I might leave it there for now. I was wondering, I mean, thank you so much for that. That is a brilliant introduction to, to the last uh, six years or so, five at least. Um, I was also wondering if perhaps uh, Jorge could, could uh, enlighten us a little bit on this, because when Podemos came to public became became known uh, particularly in, in 2015 in December 2015 when it nearly overtook uh, Bethoy in, in the elections in the general elections um, there were a few other similar movements around and there had been another similar election just in neighboring country in Portugal the other similar movement or similar party that um, had gained power earlier that year was Syriza in Greece uh, at the beginning of 2015 by the time the Spanish elections came around in December, the situation had changed quite dramatically. Equally, when uh, the socialists won in Portugal, they needed, or didn't win in fact, but could form a coalition government with the far left parties. The far left parties, namely in this case, Bloc Esquerda and the Communist Party, decided not to enter an official coalition. So I was wondering whether you could see uh, an actual parallel or any learning curves that Podemos had in that process between 2015 and the last in the last five years or since last year's election 2019, um, or whether in fact it tried to pursue, although perhaps and successfully, as, as Owen was kind of pointing out, its original trajectory of being a, a left populist, uh, completely differently organized uh, political organization. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Jana, for your questions and thanks for having me over. Um, happy to um, engage with these questions that you pose. So, to as you know, uh, as, as you pointed out and Uwen was mentioning, the rise of Podemos uh, sort of coincided with the rise of other uh, left-wing parties, in, especially in Southern Europe, right? Siriza in Greece, uh, Bloco de Esquerda in Portugal. And the initial uh, Podemos hypothesis when Podemos uh, first appears in 2014 is that if um, all these left populists or new left wing parties are successful and manage to enter government or join coalitions or influence their respective national governments, that perhaps it would be, um, that would facilitate the forming of a sort of South or Mediterranean bloc within the EU that would push against the sturdy measures uh, being imposed at the time, right? Um, Sinn Féin in Ireland was also part of that strategy it was growing at the time. The reason that, um, for example, Podemos did not reach power uh, as Syriza did in Greece, or that there was no uh, sort of immediate coalition or agreement between the, the center-left socialist and the broader left as in Portugal. Um, well, there are a number of reasons, but the first one and most obvious would be that um, while Spain was deeply affected by the 2008 crisis and the 2010 turns towards austerity, it was not in as much of a dire um, position as Greece was, right, at the time. And this is something that Podemos leaders who had basically cut their teeth working for um, left-wing governments in Latin America understood when they pointed out that um, Spain at the time had a sort of regime crisis in terms of the legitimacy of its traditional parties, but not a state crisis like Latin American countries had in the 1980s where uh, basic services stopped functioning and there's a uh, general, like, very extended legitimacy crisis in this respect. So 
that is one key difference with Greece that basically made it very hard for them to, um, for their initial strategy of obtaining victory in the space of 18, 24 months. Um, that was a big obstacle. Now, with regards to Portugal, why couldn't they form a coalition with the center-left uh, PSOE? There are a number of uh, reasons why that agreement took about four years in the making. One of them had to do with the fact that, um, so Spain, unlike Portugal, and as we can discuss further on, because the recent elections were in um, the regions of Galicia and the Basque Country, which have their own cultural and linguistic peculiarities, is a very sort of somewhat decentralized country and very diverse culturally, um, and you could say uh, in terms of uh, plurinationally. So basically what happened was that there was a, an ongoing crisis in Catalonia regarding the Catalan government's bid for independence. Um, and what happened exactly was that uh, PSOE and Pe Pe Podemos held very different positions on the matter. Not very different, but the, they became, like their differences became sharpened in the space of their political confrontation. Um, and moreover, unlike in Portugal where uh, the Socialist Party was far ahead of Bloco de Esquerda and the Communist Party. Podemos and uh, the PSOE in 2015 and 2010 were locked in a very tight competition. So as you mentioned before, Podemos initially fell like one percentage point behind PSOE. PSOE is the traditional center-left party of Spain. They've held power for more time than any other party since Spain is a democracy. And of course, they were not uh, comfortable with a, with a competitor that was uh, pressing on their heels so hard. So they tended to view Podemos as a rival. Uh, and they were not interested or were very wary of joining a coalition at the time. Now, in fairness, so was Podemos, uh, which viewed it as a possibility of becoming co-opted within a center-left government. Now, why they have chosen to do a sort of uh, government coalition now, um, why is that different from the case of Portugal? I think it has to do with Podemos' own evolution um, and the feeling that uh, after the, the losses that they received, especially the 2019 elections, they were in a position where they had to present their, their base, especially with a progression to say, it's not enough that we have propped a center-left government. We actually want to join the government and be, uh, be part of the government where we can actually make um, some real changes, right? Um, this is a strategy that is somewhat in contradiction to what they've held at different um, points in the in the past but I think in the context of the of the current uh, coronavirus crisis and the sort of line that they're pushing within the government so that they that there are no immediate austerity measures that there's an active uh, economic response that takes into account the needs of those that are um, you know in a more vulnerable position within Spanish society it's something that the Podemos base sort of welcomes the fact that they're in government right now and that they have ministers and a, a vice president in the government. On that note, um, and particularly given that, that uh, we've mentioned the original uh, uh, particularities, I kind of wanted to ask you, Tommy, why do you think, and I think this is a kind of um, accepted fact about the Podemos development in the last five years, there was a point um, in which um, the development of its, of its popularity kind of Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the last bit of your question there, Joanna. It looks like obviously the audio has just uh, gone out uh, briefly. I guess the question, the question, Tommy, was probably about the why, why did the popularity yeah. of, of, of Podemos ebb at a certain point? What were the factors behind, I guess, the, the, yeah, the, the ebbing of their popularity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and the stalling of the project. Okay. Um, right. Well, um, yeah, I guess, you know, there, there are a number of factors. Um, um, I guess, I mean, one, um, and this, I guess, looks clear sort of with hindsight, but, um, you know, there are always, there are always certain contradictions, I suppose, within the Podemos project that because, as you were saying before, Owen, um, they had this very kind of clear kind of, uh, raison d'etre like um goal to begin with um this great kind of leap to try and take the state in one big go 
you know, um, certain contradictions, for instance, like, you know, it being a, well, I suppose, for instance, like it being sort of very dependent upon the sort of uh, the charismatic, charismatic leadership of Pablo Iglesias, with there also being uh, other elements of the left within the Podemos coalition. So, for instance, maybe like the anti capitalista faction. Um, they used to be part of a group called the anti-capitalist left in Spain, you know, who would have a lot more reservations about a top-down project or something that would be too personality kind of uh, focused. So I, I, other, and, and I guess other, other factional uh, differences that later opened up, you know, to begin with, they didn't really, uh, they weren't exposed in the same way because there was this kind of shared ambition and there was this very clear goal and a kind of, as you said before, like a, a clear window of opportunity in which, you know, they they understood or their analysis <clears throat> was that, you know, that there was an, a unique opportunity to, to take the state essentially. Um, so that only, those divisions only really opened up those kind of more strategic sort of uh, the debates, I guess, really sort of opened up after they failed to, just about failed to, to gain the sort of pass on December, 2015. But, I mean, there were a number of other factors too uh, that were external. So um, one, uh, I think quite, really quite a uh, pivotal one was, well, actually before that even, I mean, there was, before that even there was, there was, um, so the appearance or, they, well, they already existed, I guess, the sort of rise of uh, Ciudadanos, which um, was, uh, is, a, is often described as a center-right party, doesn't really do it justice. I guess one of the better sort of labels right, might be liberal, kind of rightist. Um, but they were previously, you know, a relatively small party in, in Catalonia, a unionist party that, you know, even on its in, in their initial statutes described themselves as as social democratic, as a center left. They very much, you know, gained the backing of Spain's uh, financial sector, the uh, IBEX 35. And they, you know, their uh, their rise as a kind of a new, a new kid on the block that was promising some of the same uh, things that were in Podemos's agenda, i.e., you know, democratic renewal, transparency, albeit from a from a coming at coming at from coming at more from the kind of the center. That that was another factor that, to a point, kind of hit, uh, limited its rise. But then I think one of the I think one of the the really really uh sort of key factors um and this this was you know after the uh after the, the, the failures to um to negotiate a a coalition with with the PSOE um so that happened twice happened twice in 2016 and that was, was extremely damaging was eventually the uh in 2017 the uh Catalan uh, independence uh crisis um, so that shifted very much the kind of the fo focal point of uh, the political agenda in Spain away from um, some of the issues that had been dominating before and which really allowed Podemos to gain the purchase it did. So, uh, you know, the corruption of the, of the main two parties, um, austerity, inequality, um, and it kind of redirected the focus back to some of those kinds of issues that you said, you know, that they were looking to kind of sideline initially. So for instance, the national question. Um, also, uh, you know, um, there was a certain kind of re, uh, a sort of stabilization, I guess, of uh, the establishment in Spain. Um, so, you know, via brutal wage suppression um, and, you know, even, I guess, the uh, corruption uh, sort of or scandal ridden um, now emeritus king, then king Juan Carlos, he abdicated in, in 2014 um, and uh, was succeeded by his son Felipe. That was a, another, I guess, uh, sort of way in which the Spanish establishment sought to kind of, again, to, to try and uh, get a grip on on this deeper kind of crisis um, that was that you know that, that allowed for Podemos to to break through initially, um, but even yeah, I, I kind of skipped over there just for a second, so I should, I should kind of go back to it. Really, the the failure to negotiate a coalition with uh, the Socialist Party uh, for after the 
December 2015 election and then again after the repeat election uh, in 2016 really I think it did do them a lot of damage um you know they were very successfully um the media as well as uh as, well as uh, Sanchez but Pedro Sanchez um the socialist party leader at the time was really you know quite effectively able to portray Podemos as a kind of an obstructionist force not really um as a you know a, a credible party of governments and um while this was all happening too um and this is something i will 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 touch on later because it's a you know quite a a big topic in and of itself um was a an orchestrated smear campaign basically um involving um a corrupt well centering around a corrupt police chief um called uh jose uh, Villarejo, um but involving also you know elements of of the two main parties of the peso and pepe ministers involving uh involving security and police forces and, and involving elements of the corporate media in spain and there was this, a series of really quite damaging um stories that came out really at, at the time of those negotiations um which also served to just kind of I suppose not taking taking the sheen off is probably the wrong kind of uh, way to put it, um, but it, I guess um, to create a broader sense of kind of disaffection with the Podemos project, which had seemed so kind of fresh in comparison to this, uh, you know, um, yes, I guess I guess this kind of uh, you know almost moribund kind of political establishment. Um, so. I think, and you know, I guess you have to also consider that you know at the time there was just this broader sort of, uh, I suppose, the mis uh, distrust of, of of politics in Spain. So those, um, I think those those sort of fabricated scandals, if you want to call them that, they they really were quite effective at uh, sort of taking some of the initial shine off of uh, off of Podemos after you know such a uh i guess they're unex not, not exactly their unexpected success but you know they're you know to go from i think it was what like five meps in in 2014 to um uh you know um over like 20 percent of the national votes at the end of 2015 reducing uh the combined votes of the popular party the conservative popular party and the socialist party from 84 percent in 2008 to around 40 percent in 2015 you know um I th yeah, I think I, I basically I think those they weren't the only ones, but I think th those were kind of the, the the main factors that really contributed to the stalling, uh, I suppose, of of the project after you know its initial sort of giddy success. I think now we can sort of open the discussion a bit further to all of you. One of the issues I think is particularly interesting in Spain, as has been in a series of different contexts, uh, when I think you've already mentioned the uh, failure of the Corbyn project and of the Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK and, and um, Bernie Sanders in the US. Um, one of the critiques that have been bandied about was that actually they don't have a mass base. A social movement, let's call it, to support their attempts to uh, gain power. In Spain, the situation is not too dissimilar, although perhaps there is a bigger trade union culture than there, than there is at this point in either the US or, or uh, Britain. Would any of you like to pick up on the this dissonance between uh, Podemos reaching power, even as a junior partner, and the lack of you know, mobilization. What happened to Indignados? What happened to uh, uh, to KCM, to Movimiento KCM? What happened to Democracia Real? Yeah, all these like broad grassroots movements that were around during the austerity period. What happened to them? And what's their uh, concrete existence today? And is there a, a relationship? between Podemos and this coalition government that is supposedly to the left and the grassroots? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think, I guess what, what happened to Kinsey, I mean, I guess it was inevitable, no? You had this huge wave of social mobilization between sort of 2011 to, to 2014. Um, 
three years, three years of, of very volatile um, social conflict. And in a sense, you know, people, they came up against a block because the, in a sense, the, the right wing government just ignored them. They, you know, uh, famously, um, famously told, to, um, told the protesters, if you want to change anything, stand for election. And in a sense, with Podemos and with the municipalist uh, platforms at a local level, what you had was, in a sense, at a moment in which the, mo um, the social mobilization was already ebbing at that point, that to try and conserve as much as possible from this wave, or even to, to extend it, you, you would turn to the institutions. And so in a sense, Podemos, Podemos's birth marked, or yeah, marked in a sense, the ebbing, um, the ebbing of this movement. Um, there is a lot of debate, for example, around, you know, Podemos's initial organization was, would have had very, you know, grassroots organizations called circles in every, every major town and city in Spain. And in a sense, because they were sort of sidelined um, during this initial period, a lot of people just walked away. Um, but look, I mean, I think even even when you look at something like Barcelona, Barcelona in Comun, the organization of the current mayor, Ada Calau, which has a much, I think, a, um, a much more positive internal culture, it, you know, it manages to negotiate internal debates better. They haven't managed, you know, it's, it's still not a mass organization. And this isn't, that's not a task you can really, you know, address in a, in a number of years. I mean, obviously, the other question then is, can you address that task as a junior partner in government? And I think that's, that's one of the issues. We can, we can talk about that because I think, you know, obviously, you, we, you can all, already see it now. There's an uptick in, in mobilization, um, particularly industrial, in, industrial strife in Spain. Um, and would Podemos be in a better position outside uh, the coalition, maybe something like Bloco in, in, in Portugal, um, in which it could at the, at the one time be supporting the government and at the same time, you know, calling, for example, for the nationalization of um, the Nissan factory in Barcelona, um, like other left-wing groups are. In a sense, they're, they're the trade-off. Obviously, that, that's the trade-off, isn't it? Like, um, is it better to be at the table in in, in in coalition, or is it better um, to, particularly in a moment of crisis, you know, this is, um, Pablo Iglesias famously said in, in, in 2014, a crisis is, a, is the moment when a, a revolutionary can look, uh, can look the people in the eye and say, this is your enemy, you know, or these people are your enemy. Um, and in a sense, Podemos are in a difficult situation. Um, and I think when you look back at sort of the, their traje trajectory. I mean, an interesting question. I don't know what what Jorge thinks about this, but um, for example, where where do we put the in terms of diagnosing this sort of the fall off in support? I mean, there was, as Tommy mentioned, a whole host of sort of objective conditions that were changing. So, like the period sort of 2014 2016 was very distinct from what came afterwards. I think probably the most important thing is the Catalan crisis. The Catalan crisis reordered Spanish politics around a polarization, not not around like you know elites, elites versus the people, but around nationalism basically, and around the the internal enemy or the threat to Spanish unity. Um, and then you have the emergence of the of the extreme right Vox. So I think you had a whole host of conditions which I think would have made it very difficult for any left wing force to operate. But at the same time, Podemos's organizational weakness and it's internal conflicts, the diff, you know, the differences within the leadership, which emerged basically straight away once they in, in, uh, entered the institutions. Um, you know, it was all smiles in sort of the, the, the December elections, and then by February and March, under pressure, under you know, making the coalition deal, put in was, you know, it was just a complete breakdown in confidence within within the leadership, in particular between Pablo Iglesias and his. Uh, his deputy leader, Inigo Erdogan. Um, and again, Erdogan at one point disappeared for a week. He, he turned up in London, uh, giving a conference with Chantal Mouffe. Um, but no, literally, he disappeared from the political scene for a week. And so there was, um, you have this, I think, you know, very difficult terrain which Podemos were forced, have been forced to operate on. Um, 
you have, I think, the limits probably to their electoral coalition, as you mentioned, and you can see with Corbyn that at the end of the day, yeah, you can't you can't build a an electoral majority by only appealing to millennial socialists. Um, and at the same time, you have the subjective failures of of Podemos as an organization. Um, and so, yeah, like I don't know what Jorge, what do you think in terms of where would you put the sort of emphasis on the changing conditions or on the the leadership failures within within Podemos? I mean, I think so. In, in answer first to Joanna's point about uh, what happened to all the mobilization, I would say that what happens what happens to all spontaneous mobilizations, right? I mean, I lived in the U.S. at the beginning of the Trump presidency, and I remember there was uh, the the anti-inauguration march, the Women's March. There was like the, the cab strike uh, in New York at the very beginning, but like eventually that kind of um, grassroots enthusiasm you can't sustain it indefinitely in time unless you have organizations that can channel and sustain it. Um, which you, you can't build in a question of months, right? So out of the original like uh, indignados impulse, there were a lot of grassroots organizations that remained. So for example, the um, anti-eviction platforms that try and stop people from getting evicted um, and a few other groups that were very active. But uh, eventually, uh, as, you, as you were pointing out, it got to a point where like, it doesn't matter if you don't have any sort of like representative when it comes to institutional politics. It's not that you have to, it's not an either or situation, but it really helps to have someone actually like pushing um, your policies at the institutional level. And that was what Podemos was supposed to do. Now, the question with Podemos is because of the organizational choices it made, um, it became a very top-down vertical party with, a, as you were pointing out, very media-heavy um, leadership. And I find it interesting. There was a, a political, an Irish political scientist called Peter Mayer who explained very well how uh, basically Western parties under neoliberalism have become what he called cartel parties, where they basically severe their links to society. So instead of having like the kind of stuff that social democratic parties used to have, so youth clubs, unions, and so forth, they just detach uh, and disengage, and they only have a, a leadership that appears on, on TV a lot and is like communicating all the time, right? So the paradox of Bohemos is that institutionally, it became an, an anti-neoliberal party that was organized as a traditional cartel party. And so when the initial impulse um, to basically win elections in, in two years was not fulfilled, they were left without an alternative strategy. Now, to put that into perspective, I think when we talk about like, oh, why did Podemos fail and so forth, it's a very retrospective look. Podemos was very successful in the first two years. So you have to understand like um, Bernie Sanders, when he first ran for president, well, in 2015, he was not expecting to even uh, make it past the, the first primaries, right? It was just a sort of protest run to raise some issues. And eventually he almost got to seriously challenge Clinton. But Podemos was uh, in it for real, right? They really thought they could win in, in two years. So this is an extremely ambitious, um, initiative. And what happened is that once they didn't have, once it wasn't fulfilled because of the number of obstacles you pointed out, right? Um, some were external. So think, for example, like, uh, yeah, the media making some like just profoundly unfair or disqualifying attacks, uh, profoundly dishonest campaigns against them. Um, the case of Greece, when Greece, um, when Syriza failed to sort of renegotiate austerity and was imposed even harsher conditions. This was used within Spain by a lot of politicians to say that this is what will happen if Podemos ever makes it to the government, right? Um, and a few others. And then like some um, mistakes that were basically came from the Podemos leaders themselves. The main one is that, as I said, they didn't really have an alternative strategy. And what they realized once that they hadn't surpassed the PSOE is that they had built an organization that was good at getting immediate electoral gains, so in the short term, but was very bad at handling dissent. Uh, and so they got into infighting. And it doesn't really matter, like, within Podemos is always told like a, a story of uh, treasons, depending on who you side with and who was good and who was bad. And that's really not the point. The point is that there was an institutional dynamic where the, the institution itself, the way the, the party was structured, was not conducive to any kind of productive internal debate. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that the, the key here in checking Podemos' rights was 2017. Uh, three things, three very important things happened that year. The first was the Catalan crisis, which, as you pointed out, really basically reoriented the Spanish crisis away from uh, sort of, um, to put it simplistically, uh, the corrupt elites versus uh, the people, or it was like a Podemos hypothesis, towards a clash between uh, Spanish and Catalan nationalisms. Um, and so after that, two other things happened. One was a at the beginning of the year, Podemos had its um, internal Congress, well, it's, it's party Congress, where basically uh, 
there was like a month of infighting, of extremely vicious infighting before the Congress, which just, I think, demoralized a lot of the party base, regardless of who they supported, right? And then finally, there was also the case that in 2017, the Socialist Party uh, changed its leadership. So basically what they did is they ejected their previous leader because he did not want to support a conservative government. So then this guy, Pedro Sanchez, who is the current prime minister, um, once he was ejected, even though he was a traditional, like pretty much standard center left, uh, liberal third way guy, he made a comeback with a very um, anti-establishment discourse. Almost, he almost, he seemed like a Podemos politician running within the PSOE primaries. And he beat the uh, est establishment, so to speak, PSOE candidate, right? Who was backed by all the party elites and, uh, and the big media groups. Um, with a very like firebrand discourse, even though he was not a Corbyn-like figure, he was a, he had been very much opposed to like dealing with Podemos before. But in many ways, the, the way in which he won his, um, his primaries convinced people that this was a guy, right? So that took a lot of um, the thunder from Bones' feet. Suddenly you had a, a socialist party that was again on the rise with a, with a leadership that seemed more dynamic. So I think the combination of those three things really blunted Bones' rise. And that's where it really started to reverse in the polls and sink from 20% to now it currently hovers at 13, 14% of the vote. Um, but ultimately, like the, the main thing was the, the crisis over Catalonia. Tommy, would you like to add to, to this point on the sort of development of the last few years and its disconnect between Podemos possibly and uh, popular mobilization organization? You might want to speak about other uh, far left organizations in Spain, of which there are many. Right. Um, right, yeah. Um, well, I mean, um, I mean, I think uh, that's, um, I suppose, um, I guess, I guess, well, I guess basically um, in, in terms of its its disconnect with, with other, uh, with broader social movements, I suppose, um, yeah, um, as, as Jorge said, um, you know, I guess there was, uh, as, as with all um, kind of uh, phenomena like, I mean, um, the the wave of uh, sort of, of uh, left wing protests associated with the uh, 15 M movement had to obviously um, naturally sort of come to a to a to a, to a certain ebbing. Um, I would say in terms of its like later disconnect with um, with with social movements. I mean, I guess as 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 the both as both Owen and Jorge pointed out. I mean. I think um, you know, like it's even possibly worth kind of asking the question. And this is one year, I suppose you could bring in some of the other uh, left-wing parties in Spain. Um, even just leaving aside kind of you know, sort of regional, uh, you know, sort of single issue, perhaps regional uh, movements or campaigns um, based around nationalism or, or potentially other um, issues as well. Is I guess you know, it's, it's kind of it's worth. Post posing, posing the question of to what extent was Podemos even ever interested in, um, you know, uh, in in having those in having those kind of uh, deep roots w with the social with social movements. I think, I think, because of its um, sort of, I mean, Owen talked about it sort of being formulated as as a kind of a an electoral war machine, uh, which I think was Erhan's kind of phrase back in uh, in twenty fourteen. Um, you know, it, it it was very much sort of geared um, as an organisation to, to, I wouldn't say to completely marginalise um, or, or sideline um, social movements, but um, it just its structure its its structure made it very difficult for it to uh, to sort of um, I guess to replicate some of the kind of um, the uh, bonds or the uh, kind of connections that other traditional parties uh would have had with um i suppose with with, with movement of, of you know from 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 different sort of years or periods so i mean that really um in 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 kind of the regional in it, you know there's been a couple of regional elections in the last kind of year in particular and even there was one uh one uh, this month in a 
the Basque country and in uh, Galicia, where um, Podemos's their previous gains had kind of been um, absorbed by uh, regional nationalists. Um, and I think, you know, I think as as Owen's kind of pointed out as well. I mean, I think once you know, Podemos has basically been spending the past five years in a kind of in a strategy in, in which it tries to sort of engage with the institutions. And I think when the focus is is overwhelmingly on on that, it does leave very little um, very little room or very little space to uh, forge um, you know to to forge uh, some of those sort of uh, those uh, links or those connections with with social movements or with um, with broader kind of I guess uh, you know um, I suppose new forms of uh, of uh, industrial, um, you know, disputes or unrest um, or conflict as well. Um, so um, I suppose, you know, um, I would say I, I would I would really say that kind of it's almost it's 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 initial design was was such that uh, it would make it very very difficult to. Um, to I suppose, which is what it's trying to do now, to sort of reestablish some of those, some of those links, or some of those connections with, um, to with, with what is, what's been going on, um, but also to I think one thing that's going to make it very difficult for them at this stage is certainly, and this is something that's that is new. It's something we have obviously entered in a new phase now with the pandemic. Um, is there is this this sense of 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 uh, of uh, unrest at the moment in Spain, uh, obviously as um, as the country has been plunged into plunged into a new crisis, um, you know even today I think uh, G its GDP uh, um, sort of figures come out for the last quarter and showed it was down like eighteen point five percent, which is a historic drop. I mean, it's not clear yet, sort of, if there is some kind of a, a response in terms of. Um, popular unrest to this period it's not actually clear yet which a what what form it's going to take um and how it could a seek to capitalize on it or, and b sort of um i guess re-establish some kind of connection with uh with 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 that popular feeling i guess um it's very you know at, at the moment it is very uncertain and, and i mean it particularly with the kind of um the momentum that Vox gained after its after its huge gains in the repeat election uh, in November last year, um, they seem, if anything, more likely to kind of um, to capitalize on a kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, a wave of popular unrest if it's if if it goes in a you know if if it's sort of funneled along certain lines. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, Yeah, I mean, um, I guess you know, I we we probably shouldn't be too too pessimistic at the same time. I mean, I think, when, particularly when when you think in par comparative terms, I mean, Spain, Podemos have ha have had to face four general elections in four years. I mean, if that's going to exhaust any political force, let alone like a, a you know a, a new a new a new party, um, and it was designed basically to to exhaust them both. On both occasions, when there was repeat elections in the summer of 2016, and and um, it was it was basically to block you know to block Podemos. Um, so I don't know. Like I think it is it is this is this is the issue. Like you know, um, there's no there's no easy way back in those terms. I mean, I think I think at a certain point um, they could you know. I mean, I guess. It's it's very difficult to pinpoint what one moment where I you know, um, where where they sort of change change their strategy. I think probably after the re-election of of Pedro Sanchez, uh, Pablo Iglesias talked about co-governing, um, even 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 in a sort of informal parliamentary arrangement. And I think from then on, he and and his sort of and the core leadership um, in his in his circle basically bet on. Podemos's medium-term recovery was 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 linked to governing, was linked to getting into power, having 
um, having ministries and being able to um, able to win concessions and move move and be seen to move best away to the left or hold you know um, hold the line. Um, and so I think since since that time that that has been their main objective. Um, and I think I don't know. Like I mean, I guess I guess we have the question we now need to discuss is you know to to what extent has this worked out? Like you know, um, you know they've they've been in government now for six months, um, and it's an unusual government in one sense because um, as as one ex Podemos MP told me, um, Manolo Moreo, that it's that there isn't a comprehensive program for government. Um, and a lot of issues, um, a lot of issues were sort of sidelined, and there was a sort of more trunk, um, sort of a shorter, shorter document was was signed, which basically centered on on social issues. Um, and um, I guess from Podemos's perspective, they were thinking of a sort of coalition of maybe two, three years that would deliver a set of important. But somewhat limited reforms, um, you know, like uh, really assen essential reforms, but maybe not as um, ambitious as their own electoral program. Um, but obviously, COVID has changed that. Like COVID, um, COVID has, yeah, I mean, you know, it has re has rearranged that in the sense that it's opened up a completely different scenario um, in which the decisions that are being made now and in the next year or two. Are going to define Spain for the next de decade and onwards. Um, so there are mon much more fundamental questions at, at play now. Um, the idea of the coalition was the, um, the calculation was that Spain was entering a, a moment of stabilization, a moment of um, relative calm. Um, and obviously, to be honest, with you, that's what I what I what I believed in January. You know, I thought, okay, this it was worth given the lack of social mobilization, given the lack of um, anything else that this this made this strategy made sense um, under the, under those given conditions. Other people disagreed, and you know for very very legitimate reasons. Um, and I think obviously, yeah, COVID COVID changes the terms of the debate. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean the que the question is obviously to what extent have Podemos managed in in the last the last six months to 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 push peso in a more radical direction um there's a you know what has been their degree of influence I, you know and i think you would have to say it's been ambiguous you know it's um there are real positives and then there's a lot of times where they've had to you know seed important concessions i think the positive is you know they have as as jorge uh, mentioned in a sense um established a certain safety net emergency safety net to deal with with the pandemic um and i mean obviously the star the star measure in this is the um what is it called the uh, guaranteed base um yeah guaranteed base guaranteed base minimum income, income yeah that's it yeah i don't want to get get that mixed up yeah guaranteed minimum income it's not it's not a base basic income so it's which will which will you know assist about a million people a million a million actually not a million people a million homes or a million families um, who are at risk of poverty, um, and I think you know, in a, Spain, Spain's Spain's wel welfare state has a lot of holes in it, um, and I think this was a, re a really important game for them. Um, they've also passed, you know, other other minor thing, minor sort of well, not minor, but um, I guess temporary temporary measures, um, and passed an, an important uh, sexual violence law um, to deal with the. Uh, the question of consent and uh, Spain's, Spain's laws around rape. So I think they have had gains, but at the same time, for example, I don't know, like I, I guess one, one big set concession was in March, Podemos pushed for a, a more, moratorium on, um, on a, the cancellation of rents, rent payments. Um, and then they only managed to get a policy which is very similar to what Keir, uh, Keir Starmer is proposed in 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 the UK, and is, you know much maligned proposal of um, the 
the rents are postponed and they get loans to pay them off. So basically, you know, people who can't pay their rent are becoming further indebted. Um, obviously, that's not what Podemos wanted, but that's what they were pushed or for, you know, pushed into accepting. Um, and I think, you know, one of the issues maybe we can talk about is the, the actual balance of power within within the government. Um, probably the most powerful figure at cabinet, including um, when you include Sanchez, even the uh, prime minister, the most powerful figure is the economic minister or the economic uh, de um, deputy premier, uh, Nadia Calvino, who... Who is who was the former head of budgetary budgetary affairs uh, for the European Commission, um, and she gets, you know, I think Miguel Urban, the uh, Euro Dep um, Euro Euro MP, uh, European um, Member of Parliament, explained to me or put it when I talked to him um, a few months ago that it, it's as if the Troika have their own their own representative at the Spanish cabinet. I mean, this is you know a lifelong Eurocrat. Um, in which it's not clear whether her her loyalties are primarily to Spain or primarily to Brussels, and I think her influence comes from that. Her, her influence comes from the fact that Spain, at the moment, is is dependent on on EU support, um, and so I think one, I guess, one sort of telling moment in the last few months has been um, there was an, an announcement. I think it was in May to of an agreement between PSOE, Podemos, and the Basque party, Bildu, um, to repeal, to fully or to completely repeal the, the right-wing labor reforms, which make, makes it easier to uh, to fire fire people, it makes it cheaper to fire people, it restricts um, trade union rights. And this this was one of the cornerstones of the program for government, but uh, Calvino has, has always um, opposed repealing these reforms. Um, and so this, this this agreement, this agreement was um, was published, um, was released. the The document was was released of this agreement between the three parties, in which it said completely repeal the labour reforms. Um, and then suddenly, at midnight, the same day, the the PSOE did a, a rapid U turn and WhatsApp WhatsApp journalists to say this the document or the passage in which read fully repealed was null and void. Um, Calvino hadn't been informed. She she got in touch with Sanchez, uh, backed by the the employers' association association, and basically um, vetoed the deal. I mean, you know, this was a policy was announced, and then your deputy your deputy pr premier vetoes vetoes the deal. So I think maybe that's that's something we could we could discuss the the internal dynamics of the of the coalition. Absolutely. I mean, I am particularly interested in knowing where does the future of Podemos lie? And in particular, if we think within the crisis, within the context of the pandemic, of the COVID-19 pandemic, if we think about the euro bonds that have been so lengthily debated and where Sanchez had the nonetheless, even if minor, nonetheless important role in the debate, where does then uh, Podemos lie? in the midst of all this and in the months and possibly years to come if the government holds of course uh jorge maybe you might want to start jorge jorge unmute your microphone Sorry, I was I was speaking alone. Uh, I was going to say no. I was just saying that, um, yeah. As you were pointing out before, basically the problem for Spain is that it's in an incredibly dire situation economically, as are other countries. But we just had the the economic figures for the last uh, three months come out, and and they're even worse uh, comparatively than they are for France, than they are for Italy. It has to do with how strict the confinement was here, but also with the fact that our economy is basically structured around um, well, the, the the very like large uh, amount of the economy that is taken over by the tourism sector is highly volatile in a context such as the the COVID crisis right so basically what's gonna like spain is dependent on european support right now um and the i wouldn't perhaps say the a good news but at least ambiguous news and, and better than 2018 is that the response from the eu has been a bit more proactive uh, so spain is getting right now like 85 
billion dollars in that's just in grants from the EU starting in 2021, right? Uh, and some, and then like the similar amount in loans from then onwards as part of a recovery program. So that amounts to like over 11% of its GDP as a stimulus program. Now, the question is, is it going to be like 2008 and then 2010 when after there's this uh, spike in public debt? Or well, part of this debt will come from the EU level, which is uh, a novelty and it's good. But if the Spanish de state becomes more indebted in order to get out of this crisis, which it has to do, will it be the case that two years from now, three years from now, you're demanded to do more austerity? Um, that remains to be seen. I think um, part of the reason why in this crisis there has not been an immediate push for austerity, as some countries want it, right? So, like for example, the, the government of uh, the Netherlands is notorious for um, taking a very hard line in the EU Council meetings. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that um, so a lot of Southern European countries, especially uh, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, have taken a relatively common stand together. Um, and I think it's no coincidence in all of these three countries, um, parties that became or either like surged out of nowhere or became very reinforced after the 2008 crisis and the turn to austerity. So Podemos, Bloco de Esquerda, but also the Five Star Movement have been are either supporting the government or inside the current government in each country, right? And I think there's been instrumental in like pressing for a common line that doesn't repeat the mistakes of 2010 and onwards. Having said that, we'll have to see what happens uh, two, three years down the line. So that is, I think, the, the main problem regarding the the relationship with the EU. Now, as for the internal dynamics of the coalition, I mean, in fairness, like I've always been pro, uh, like personally in favor of, of Podemos joining a coalition with PSOE, basically because this is the problem that left wing, like new left wing or left populists or however you want to call them, parties and movements face is that eventually, if you want to govern, you have to reach some sort of um, agreement. Uh, truce or, or collaborative agreement with the traditional center left right um now the question is i was a bit wary of the way that this one was um uh, arrived at because of the weak position that podemos finds itself in relative to the PSOE right now so for podemos in many ways this has been a, a sort of um not fleeing forward but it is a way to like present its base as that it's doing something meaningful but also like it, it just cannot afford to out compete so anymore, right? That is not a viable option in the short term. So they are locked as a junior partner and they have to do sometimes, um, as you're pointing out, um, I think there's been some other, like the, the case of the labor reform law is a bit confusing because there was no consensus regarding how it should be reformed immediately. Uh, and that was actually something where like the Podemos people who were like uh, helping draft that statement with the PSOE and Bildu uh, were also having trouble with the, um, not the economy minister, but the labor minister, who is a very interesting figure, she is from Izquierda Unida, so the traditional Euro Communist Party. Um, but she's a labor lawyer for a long time, and her her point was that like like to take down this law, it's the, basically like the the different legal mechanisms are very intertwined in a way that you can't just like outvote it in a in parliament at once, and you need to do it in a scaled down process. So there was some internal debate regarding whether that was um, just um, conceding a, a defeat to Pesur or not. But it is true, it is undoubtedly true that it is a, a junior partner. Now, I think even then it has been important in the context of this crisis, like Podemos has been key, I think at, at times in, in like, whenever PSOE gets cold feet in order to push it to do, to be a bit more proactive, right? And its responses, the um, the minimum, the basic, uh, the minimum ingreso vital, vital minimo, the, the labor law that we were talking about before, just basically a, guaranteed minimum income for households under a certain um, threshold. That was like, a lot of the policy was developed by um, PSOE people, but a lot of the political push came from from, um, from Podemos. So I think they've been instrumental in that. And that's like, it's a very important measure. It's, you could say it's insufficient. It could certainly be extended. It should be, it will have to in the future, but it's a good um, step forward at the time. Um, what else has it done? I think like one of the biggest, for me, at least, one of the more pleasant surprises has been uh, Yolanda Diaz, the, the labor minister that I was mentioning before. Um, she's very articulate and she's like not just a good politician, but also very solvent technically, right? Um, and that's something that we don't see so much in the left uh, or we don't see as much as we probably should, which is that we have a lot of like, there are a lot of people who have like an activist background and so on, but she also has the, the technical expertise, right? So. Um, I don't know, I think she's a reassuring presence for Podemos' base within the government. 
but undoubtedly they are in a very um it is a vulnerable position and uh, it is a risk that you take and the other risk is you know if things go badly you will not be rewarded electorally that is very clear but if things go well and this government manages to uh, i don't know strike a way out of the crisis slowly but surely it may be the case that people identify that success with the PSOE, right? Um, and the president was obviously more visible at Pedro Sánchez than with Podemos, right? So next time around, they will just think like, okay, I, I like what this coalition did, so I will just vote for PSOE, which will guarantee me a new iteration of it. So yeah, that's where I think it stands. I was wondering if now we could jump into some questions from the audience, from everyone uh, watching tonight. By the way, if you're watching, if you're liking this, despite the many technical issues, for which I also apologize at my end, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Jacobin channel on YouTube and everything else. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, you name it. Um, so these questions are a little bit back in our conversation tonight. There's two pertaining to more localized questions. I'll start one by uh, Jaime Perales, or maybe Jaime Perales. Um, what is the difference between Podemos and En Común Podem? Uh, uh, is it the Catalan brand of Podemos or a coalition that includes Podemos in that region? Um, and at the same time, now that we're talking about Catalonia, uh, Mark Mongrifo has asked, why hasn't Podemos succeeded in the South and former strongly left-wing areas? So I guess this is a question again about the regional particularities of Spain and how that has affected uh, Podemos' success and fails. I don't know which one of you wants to answer this. Uh, I, I just talked, so I will pass and the, let someone else handle it. <laughs> I'll take the coward option. Maybe Tommy, do you, do you want to you wade into yeah. the question of why has it not been successful in Catalonia? Why has Podemos not been successful in Catalonia? I mean, well, rather, um, I mean the, question, the question is in the south. Sorry, I don't want, I don't want to misquote oh, Mark. Oh, Mark, oh sorry. In the south, in former strong mm -hmm. left wing areas. So I guess that includes Catalonia. Ooh, is Tommy still with us? Um, if not, Owen, you're more than welcome to jump in before Tommy comes back. So or, or just, just to be clear, are you asking me, you're asking me about, when you say this, you're asking me about the south of Spain place, Andalusia, or, or I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm, I, just, I heard your question clearly. You're muted, Owen. Sorry, yeah, the, di um, the difference in Andalusia, I guess, is, is that the anti-capitalista, the Trotsky um, group, group grouping that was in Podemos until about, I don't know, like um, until this spring um, was, was always in charge. That was their sort of um, strongholds with uh, Teresa Rodriguez. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think they polled pretty well. I can't, like, you know, I think they got something that was at like 18% in the last regional elections, maybe. Like, now it looks quite good. Um, obviously, in Catalonia, Podemos won in Catalonia in 2015. It was the, the largest national party at that, that moment. So, um, yeah, within 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 that umbrella group of um, En Comun Podem, which I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's... It's more or less put it. It's Podemos plus the local local organizations, basically, um, more or less. Is that is that correct? I think so. Tom. Well, if we want to go back to Tommy to now answer, <laughs> now you're back online. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Um, just just in terms of the the question, um, which. Um, because I I don't think I, I possibly just because of my connection I, I didn't I didn't I didn't hear it. It seemed like there was two different. You were asking me two different questions, or there was two different parts to the question. There were yes, there were two different yeah. parts of the question. Do you want me to repeat them? I can happily repeat them. So again, that would be helpful. From Jaime Perales, there is a what is the difference between Podemos and and Como Podem, uh, and is it just a 
Catalan offshoot of Podemos, or is it some sort of coalition locally? And then I think because they're intertwined, these questions, um, Mark Mungrifu asks, why hasn't Podemos been successful in the South and formerly strong areas? Okay. Um, well, I guess to kind of, yeah, to take a, more from the second, uh, sort of the Southern there, because I think, I think I was kind of answered the, um, the first bit of the question, you know, um, why is it, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, first, you I mean, first you, you could dispute, yeah, whether it's not mean to guess, I mean, as, as he said, um, you know, looking back at it, um, Adelante Andalucía as results in December 2018, uh, which was actually funny. It was the regional election that saw Vox make its kind of uh, breakthrough um, in terms of uh, having kind of representation in in any uh, kind of, of the Spanish Parliament. Um, um, I mean, I think if it's, I think you know, if you're, I would say like if you're looking at you know traditional. Peso strongholds, yeah, like you know, Extremadura can be another one too. Um, I think, yeah, why Podemos struggled to make a breakthrough in some of those areas or kind of overtake the Peso. Um, well, I guess it, some of it comes down to a, um, I guess, partially to, to demographics and, um, you know, for instance, I mean, if, if you're looking at Andalusia, for instance, so. Um, the candidate that uh, Pedro Sanchez um, defeated unexpectedly in his kind of comeback primaries campaign in in 2017, uh, Susana Diaz um, is, um, you know, she, she was kind of the regional president of Andalusia, and um, there is, um, you know, like um, the PSOE lost control of the parliament in Andalusia. Um, in December 2018 for the first time in, you know, um, I, I don't know how many years, I think it was for the first time since the, you know, the in, in, in since the return to democracy, so, um, or post-transition politics. Um, so I think, you know, insofar as you're kind of arguing that they haven't really broken through, I mean, they have to a certain degree. I think it is very difficult to, to break through in some of those um, areas where the PESO have traditionally been dominant particularly because just even in demographic terms, for instance, if you're looking at somewhere like Extremadura, um, you know, because, uh, you know, in, in economic, it's what well, it's uh, largely agrarian and um, a lot of, uh, you know, and this is, this is, a, this is a sort of a, a sort of a big economic feature of Spain. The overwhelming majority of young people in places like that would, would move to the big cities, would move to Madrid, would move to Barcelona, would move to an, another urban center in order to find work so therefore i guess a lot of it's um a, lo a lot of it's key kind of um voters you know don't don't reside i mean less the case now that we see more the case in somewhere like extremadura don't reside i guess um so in you know in such great numbers in uh, some of the sort of particularly less populous uh parts of southern spain um and i suppose i guess and this is uh, this is something there, there would have, there would be a great deal of debate about as it, as it would be kind of in any of uh, sort of regional branch of spanish politics but even though you know people wouldn't necessarily associate andalusia as having as you know whenever, whenever people think of the kind of uh regional autonomy or kind of independence movements they think of uh, obviously for, um, you know un understandably um the Basque country and Catalonia, but you know, even in places like Andalusia and Extremadura, there is quite a, I suppose, a particular and strong sense of parochial identity or regional identity, um, which perhaps a party like Podemos, um, being overwhelmingly, you know, coming out of a as, as Owen said, um, of uh, you know, uh, of, of academics based around a, a university in Madrid, is just even in cultural terms, there is a disconnect there, which. Um, which can be difficult, I suppose, for, you know, has been difficult for them to get over. Um, and then I suppose, um, I think this has been the case, and I guess this has been the case with, with, with all of their kind of regional branches or affiliates or the groups that they've backed, you know, the, the kind of connect, I think, you know, the, the, the connections with, with, what, with uh, whatever kind of groups ended up running in, in um, you know, for, so back in 2015, 
um, a lot of uh, a lot of groups that were, that were sort of affiliated with Podemos or that they backed um, basically swept the council, councils in some of the biggest cities uh, in in Madrid, and they also had some impressive um, uh, performances at the regional level. Um, this was very much, you know, at the time as we were discussing at the beginning of the conversation, when Podemos' kind of star was in the ascendant. And these other kinds of divisions or problems hadn't really opened up, but in the kind of intervening period, um, you know, the, whatever li links there have been with those um, confluencias, as they're called, or some of the other groups that they backed have, have frayed quite considerably for a number of reasons. Um, and I think one thing that really, I guess, again, you know, last, um, it, and this was very, very clear last year in, in, uh, in May, just after the general election in April 2019, there was sort of on the same date, you had sort of uh, regional, local and European elections, which really um, brought into sharp relief, I guess, the degree to which Podemos, um, you know, could, they, they, you know, they, they're clearly still very much able to kind of rally their base, um, particularly around the figure of, of Pablo Iglesias um, during a general election campaign, but that they hadn't done this kind of harder work, arguably, or, uh, you know, um, that, they, that they hadn't, and that's maybe being a bit unfair, that maybe they hadn't been so successful in um, sort of setting down roots, I suppose, in, um, in more peripheral parts of, of Spain. Um, and, you know, like um parties like like yeah the, the socialist party obviously have a certain there's a there's still a degree of of uh residual kind of machinery of residual um structures in these places which you know made it very very difficult for um for Podemos to kind of to compete and i mean and in, and in the areas where they did do slightly better actually andalusia was was one of them it was partially because the um the kind of the ticket they're running on actually um was was a, was a shared one with the um, sort of uh, outgrowth of the of the, the uh, former communist party there, and they were able to tap into some of that um, whatever you want to call it that kind of electoral apparatus, or um, just even in terms of activists on the ground. Whereas in other parts, um, yeah, being particular, you know, uh, I haven't looked at it in, in great detail, but I imagine somewhere like Extremadura, they would have. Um, you know wh whatever exists of Podemos on the ground would be very would be very scant. Um, so um, I think that um, answers sort of the second part of the question, insofar as it insofar as I agree with it, the premise of it. Thank you. And I mean, I have one more question from the audience that I think would be useful to answer and perhaps could lead to our final conclusions for tonight's uh, show. It comes from Paul uh, Prescott. And the question is, what kind of relationship does Paul must have with the trade unions in Spain? Now, this is something that we've already touched on with comparing it to uh, trade union relationships in countries like uh, the US or the United Kingdom uh, for, I guess, many of our listeners and watchers tonight are from those countries. That would be great. Um, who is the happy volunteer? Maybe Owen, I can feel him like burning mm. with desire to answer the question. <laughs> um, no, no, I'll let Jorge maybe deal out. Do you want to do it? No, I mean, I would say like the short answer is that what the kind of relationship Go does Podemos well, have with his Go own... Uh, okay. I mean, the thing historically in Spain is that um, as in most other Western European countries or the United States, uh, like unionized labor force has been in decline for the last 40 years, right? Uh, but historically, the two main unions were somewhat like um, more or less formally linked to the two main parties of the left, which are the Socialist Party and the Communist Party. Um, so like the Socialist Party had its own like very much union arm in the classic way that a Social Democratic Party had. Um, the, the party institution links were configured in such a way that like Pessoa was the stronger actor than UGT, which was its union. Uh, and when Podemos first showed up, it like did some budding attempts to to create its own union, right? The idea being that, um, well, we need to have some like organizational muscle, and not just be a, a party. But it's one of these initiatives, like the circles, that was um, taken up with a lot of enthusiasm, but never never really got anywhere. So within Podemos's ranks, you will find a lot of people who come from 
like the leading ma um, labor unions, and especially uh, Comisiones Obreras, which was a union that was uh, formed during the late Franco years, clandestine union at first, um, like loosely linked to the Communist Party, largest union in the country at the time. And so like a lot of their, their people have ended up in, or not, like people who worked uh, for a long time in Comisiones have ended up in, in, in Podemos, right? Um, so there is like, um, but there's, there's no, there's not a formal link between the party and the union. They have good relationships, but um, it, it's not like Podemos as a union of itself. Like funnily enough, uh, Vox, which is the, uh, so like our, our radical rights party uh, has the same name as the, like the outlet in the US that is like the liberal uh, blog, or like the Ezra Klein place. Uh, it's also called Vox. Uh, and they are they are trying to set up their own uh, union, which they recently announced. Which is very strange because it's like a, a profoundly neoliberal party. They are very much against any anything like related to welfare state or to the state's intervention in the economy. Uh, and they're doing that in a very blatant way, They're just saying, "Yeah, we'll have our own union." Uh, but I was never like that blatant about it. And um, I wonder if they perhaps should have tried. Of course, it's not just uh, as easy as declaring that you want to have a union and to have one but to actually develop something independently when they were drawing on more organic strength at the beginning of the party, right? When there was a lot of grassroots enthusiasm. But again, this was something that was sort of at odds with the, 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 the strategy of like, let's have a very vertical, vertical party with a media driven um, leadership. Um, and so not, not very like developed links to, to civil society. So I would say they have good relationships with um, some of the leading unions. They have like some people who come from them who end up like, taking positions of leadership in Podemos, and they, but uh, they don't have a, a, um, a formalized relationship is what I would say. Thank you, Jorge. And now I was wondering if we could have some final remarks and in particular, given that we have such an excellent panel of, of um, Discussions. If you could all each, in the very brief terms, say what them process has meant to you politically as an analyst. Um, so, oh, and this time I do give you the word first. How do you feel it has changed your uh, perspective as a political analyst and as a journalist? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, I think I feel I've learned. I, th I think you know, I I I arrived in in Madrid in in two thousand and fifteen. I I do feel like the the Spanish left and Podemos in particular has given me a great political ed education. Um, and I think one of the great things about the Spanish left, and I think it's maybe something they don't really realize themselves, is the level of I don't know intellectual debate within within it. Um, and I think it has, you know, it's been a real pleasure being able to go and, you know, interview leading figures, but also just talk to, 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 you know, regular activists or, you know, people who are interested in politics. So I think, I think for me, my five years in Madrid has, has given me a, a great political education. Um, and I think that's what Podemos has given me. Um, obviously, I guess the other issue might be, you know, where where is the party going to go? Because I mean, obviously, as we've talked about, it has it has um, it's had this very interesting trajectory. And I suppose um, you know, it, I think it's it is a great country to to study politics in because it is we, we've had such sort of rapid swings. Um, and I think you know, um, coming into the autumn, it, it, it's going to be another interesting period. I mean, uh, the. <laughs> Spain hasn't had a, a budget passed, and I think I don't know, it was like four years at this point, or five years even. Um, and so the budget negotiations in the, in in September, October are going to be are going to be very interesting. I think will be a moment of truth for Podemos. I mean, um, what what could, you know what um, you know what advances can it can it uh, get from its agenda? Like I mean, there's a lot. For example, they're they they're trying to push this uh, COVID tax, um, you know, wealth tax. Um, I think whether that will be in the budget or not is going to be a, an indication of where, of the sort of internal balance of power within the coalition, um, and just generally on taxation, uh, on things like how you know there's going to be a whole um, list of issues which in the budget are going to sort of become more 
become clearer basically so i think you know yeah i mean i i feel i've 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 got a lot of you know a lot ahead of um you know writing about podemos interacting going to their meetings um and yeah i mean i think it's you know that's the thing i mean obviously the plus of of a of a party that's um you know founded by university press professors is the level of intellectual debate i mean I, I would have a lot of you know political disagreements with someone like Inigo Erahon, but he's you know a, a brilliant te um, theorist. I mean you know um, sort of taking very very dense uh, post structural theory and and turning it into sort of you know a, a manual for sort of um, political communication. I think you know it's obviously he didn't do it alone. It was it was the group, but uh, you know um, so I think yeah no I feel I I feel I've got a lot from them, and I think it's. It's an interesting case within that wider uh, wider context of of other sort of left populist surges. Um, so yeah. I don't know if anybody else wants to to jump in there. Yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, I mean, for me, it's been a. <laughs> an interesting learning curve, uh, both analytically, but also politically and personally, because I, uh, so when Podemos first appeared, I was in Spain, but like throughout like the 2014 to 2017, I lived between the US and Spain. So I had the, the chance of um, witnessing Podemos in the first Bernie Sanders campaign, I sort of appear at the same time period, which is very interesting. And um, to also participate in both. Um, so mostly with uh, like, canvassing and voting for Bernie and doing like uh, a little bit of foreign policy analysis for Podemos. Um, and in both cases, it was very, very engaging and very stimulating. But of course, uh, ultimately, at least from the vantage point of today, um, you do learn that like, I mean, if, you, if you're interested in institution politics and making like institutional change, it's like an effort that takes really a lot of time and investment and there are no shortcuts to it. Um, even if you, like, it's really good, it's really important to hit with a good discourse, like Podemos did, right, to have a good um, media strategy, those things really help. Um, they shouldn't be looked down upon. Um, like Podemos was criticized a lot when it first came out because it innovated in a way, it didn't like speak in the way that a left party in Spain was expected to speak. But that was uh, actually very effective. Um, but the thing is that ultimately there is no shortcut. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's a pathway to acquire, at least in a, in a European country, um, political power at the state level on governing alone in the space of, of, of two years or or even a presidential campaign for, for Bernie. So um, it's a, a, like a steep learning curve, a bittersweet experience in that sometimes you, you get your hopes raised up and then they're not met. But I think what the I, I value is a very positive one. And of course it has taught me a lot about um, politics at a at a practical level and not just something that um you look at and that other people do for you all right um and i mean similarly uh, in, in in some ways though, and i mean yeah it has without doubt been you know obviously a, um it's been a very steep learning curve um sort of uh I guess documenting their um, their experiences, but also yeah, um, very much um, a political education, and um, yeah, uh, I think you know something that again similarly, you know, uh, similar to what Owen said, it, it, you know, I think we're both because um, obviously sometimes we've been kind of working on these projects together. We've both been kind of struck uh, by the degree to which um, I suppose so many you know that they are uh, kind of academics by nature and so they they really sort of uh they thrive on on debates and discussion and they really you know i think even when i sometimes compare them to equivalent projects in in other countries and in the uk or in ireland i think they have a curiosity um for um for you know for i guess uh what's going on outside of outside of their own kind of uh backyards to a degree which is you know really um you know, yeah, just very, just very impressed and very, you know, um, you know, previously to this, I, you know, I guess, you know, and and still now, even after what I'm when I'm asking politicians about 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 certain things, you know, all that, you know, you get is is nothing but like the part the party line and uh, in as few words as possible, or you know, um, so to 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 I guess to you know come across people who are in some cases, you know, obviously in 
you know, in in a position where they have a lot to, to lose potentially by by engaging with you and, and, and engaging with your questions kind of in good faith. Um, you know, to, to, you know, to have them to actually um, sort of, you know, provide that, that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of discussion, you know, has, has, has been great. Um, also, I think, you know, again, like I, I came, um, when I was sort of first in Spain, I was in a more provincial part of Spain. It wasn't necessarily um, around what was happening in Madrid where um, the Podemos project was kind of starting off, but, um, yeah, like uh, I, I could see, um, particularly with reference to Corbynism, how um, how other projects like it. I think, in particular, like Momentum, took quite a lot of cues from from Podemos and and Podemos's initial uh, successes. Um, it was just, it was, it was, it was very refreshing just to 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 see um, to see a, a project kind of uh, have, I suppose, in in the way that they did, kind of. Um, I guess di ditched, as as Jorge sort of uh, pointed out, ditched the, some of the the kind of um, the shibboleths of, of 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 the traditional left, and with mm. but without kind of losing that um, that content of uh, you know um, of, of of I suppose you know trying to re of representing the social majority of um, of having a kind of um, an agonistic kind of. Uh, uh, approach um so yeah i mean i guess um although like it you know and particularly kind of feels uh kind of uh yeah you feel quite acutely now obviously after um after uh, the the results in the uk in in december and also uh after um, bernie sanders uh not not getting the the, the nomination uh the democratic nomination in in the states um but you know, yeah, even just the curiosity of 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 uh, at the moment of of seeing uh, one of these left populist uh, projects in in government is is fascinating, and um, you know, like I think something that uh, I guess though it probably has come out in in, in this discussion to a certain degree um, is that you know you, the last five years in Spanish politics have been so incredibly sort of intense, and you know, like each of if you're just counting Vox. You know, each of the previous four parties, two to them were sort of newcomers, had all led national polls um, at some stage over the the previous four years by and by significant margins as well. Um, you know, so I guess just just to, to sort of, you know, it it almost feels like it, it almost feels like you've been reporting on a decade of politics um, rather than just just a couple of years. So I guess even just the uh, you know the, the experience that that's that's afforded and i guess some of the yeah, observations uh obviously initially um when, uh sort of giving us giving you a lot of cause for hope and then later sort of stripping uh some of those illusions um you know has yeah um has been yeah invaluable certainly as as an as a young journalist you know still trying to still trying to develop i guess so And on that lovely note, I want to thank every single panelist tonight, Owen, Jorge, Tommy, thank you so much for joining us. And for you out there watching this tonight, thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Your support makes shows like tonight's show possible. It makes even more shows possible. So don't forget to, again, click the button, like, subscribe. Thank you all. Very good night. Thank you.